So uh, it belongs more or less to uh, classical uh, theology and I would say to, to mainstream Orthodox Christianity to confess that God foreknows everything and also that God causes everything. That is to say, he creates all things and all events, including everything that exists and everything that happens in this very moment. And, well, you know, um, everybody feels, I have it in between quotation mark, everybody feels that there is something fishy here, you know, that it feels as if this confession is not really compatible with uh, the existence of chance and freedom in creation. But this kind of gut feeling that there is something wrong um, or, or that there is at least tension between, on the other hand, on the one hand, God's foreknowledge and God's uh, all-causing will. And on the other hand, human freedom, I leave aside the natural chance for, for the moment, it's not so easy to really spell out in detail what the problem is. And my point is what I want to talk about uh, this afternoon is um, to, to explain uh, what my view is on the problems that are involved and that there are in fact two problems um, involved, which I have labeled the problem of temporal fatalism and the problem of causal determinism. Just had to find some labels, so um, that's what I came up with. And um, so, but first, what I uh, what I'll do is say something about God talk, uh, in particular about the verbs or the actions that we attribute to God. Then, into that will be the main part into the distinction of the two problems of temporal fatalism and causal determinism. And then, uh, because I think causal determinism, that will be pretty easy to understand, but to understand exactly what the problem is with temporal fatalism, I'll spend some extra time, which is the third part, on what is exactly the problem of temporal fatalism. Um, so I also have certain solutions. I have also had solutions to both problems, but, um, then we need another um, another uh, session to do that, but maybe things will come up in the discussion afterwards. So, um, speaking about God, you know, when we speak or when Scripture speaks um, uh, about God, they use um, a, a, a large number of um, of, uh, of adjectives, uh, but also of verbs. You know, all kinds of different verbs are uh, predicated on God. And I would argue that all these different actions do not really reflect, or do not reflect real differences in the Godhead, in Godhead um, uh, itself. That's because of the doctrine of divine simplicity, but I will not go into that. At least I will not go into that. Um, but focus on, um, well, even if all these actions are not really different from God themselves, still the meanings we attach to these verbs, these meanings differ. The, all these words are not, uh, do not become uh, synonymous when we predicate them of God. Some of you who might know more about um, Aquinas will probably recognize uh, Aquinas's idea that of uh, analogous um, use of terms predicated of creatures and of God. Okay, so different verbs that we use um, or that we predicate of God. Some of these verbs, some of these verbs do not express a relation. They just have no grammatical object. For example, that, that we would call in grammar uh, intransitive verbs. For example, to be, uh, to live, you know, God is, uh, God lives, we use that kind of verbs for God. And these verbs have no object. But there are also verbs that do express a, a relation, that do have um, um, a grammatical object. And these 
are called transitive verbs in grammar, and they can be subdivided in um, imminent acts and in transient acts. So some of these transitive verbs express imminent acts and others express transient acts. So that sounds maybe a bit vague, but I'll give some examples. So um, transitive verbs that um, express imminent acts, they have a grammatical object, but it is an intentional object. So it is an object that remains within the agent. And the classical examples are the verbs to know and to will. So what you know, the object of knowledge, and what you will, that does not necessarily have to uh, exist um, at the same time as um, the action. For example, um, uh, when we predicate these, uh, when we predicate these verbs of God, they are set of God, as Heinz puts it, up eterno, from eternity. So, for example, we can say that uh, God knows from eternity that Harm Horus will you know, present uh, something about divine action on November, is it 2019, 20, uh, in the year 2021. God knows so that from eternity. So that is an eternal act of God. But of course, I'm very happy, and you probably are happier, that my presentation is not eternal. My presentation is only for five or 45 uh, minutes. Um, then we have uh, other transient verbs, uh, sorry, transitive verbs, that, but they have the real object, and these express so-called transient acts. And these uh, acts, when they are predicated um, uh, of God, they uh, indicate that the external object exists at that very same time. So, for example, when we uh, predicate of God verbs like to create, justify, or save, or bless, or in short, verbs that express some kind of causal, that, that, that express a causal relation to the object, then these verbs are predicated of God extempore, in time. So, um, for example, um, though it's right to say that God knows from eternity that Harm Chorus will be justified, it's not, it's false to say that God justifies me from eternity. He justifies me in time. So this is just a matter of grammar and of logic. Now, when we talk about these transient acts, then you know it seems as if uh, God changes. So that's uh, the final remark here on the slide, that, um, that such transient acts imply a change. But um, this is a change that exists only on the side of the object of the creature, not of the subject of God. It is so-called a Cambridge change. So I'll stop just to give an example. Um, so I hope you can see me now all. Um, so this is a chair, this is me. Uh, now I am on the, at least for me, on the right, the, the chair is on my left side. Now the chair, my right. Now it sounds, uh, where is the chair on the left side, now the chair is on my right side. It sounds as if the chair has changed. But and as you could see, the chair didn't change, I changed. So that's uh, what is expressed by this, what is called the Cambridge uh, change, that there is not really um, a, a change in the one of uh, which the action or the property is predicated on. So I'll resume my, my presentation. Um, yeah. 
Um, so when we say, well, first, God does not save Harmachoris, and then he saves him, that's the difference. The real difference is only in me, not uh, in God. Okay. Um, so, well, now I've laid more or less the groundwork for distinguishing uh, the uh, the two problems that we have with divine foreknowledge and divine uh, causation. And uh, as I said before, I label these problems um, temporal fatalism and causal determinism. Well, what's the difference between, or how do I distinguish these two problems? Um, first, when we talk about temporal fatalism, we talk about a problem that is related to God's knowledge in particular to his foreknowledge. In contrast, go to the right side of the slide, in contrast, causal determinism is related to speaking about God's will. Now, to go back to knowledge, uh, as we saw in the, you know, as I tried to explain before, uh, to know is an imminent act. Um, and to know does not, the verb itself, does not imply that the object, what is known, exists in reality simultaneously at the same time as the act of knowing. What is known is an intentional object. Now, with to will, as I mentioned before, strictly speaking, to will is an imminent act. Can, for example, mean to choose uh, something uh, free. However, in, in, in actual religious language, to will, that God wills something, is often understood not as an imminent act, but as a transient act. That is, it means that God does something, that God causes something, that, that God creates something. And in this case, um, to will as a transient act um, implies that the object exists in reality at the same time as the act of willing. You know? So when God causes X, at that very same time, X exists. And God did not cause X before that. But God, when God causes X, you know, it just logically implies that X exists in that very moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, yeah, 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 I think I missed. The, um, so, the temporal fatalism uh, that's about God's knowledge, which is said of eternal from eternity, contrasted with God's will, understood as causation, so as a transient act, which is said extempore. Now, the temporal fatalism has to do with, it's what I would call a diachronic problem. It has to do with time. And in contrast, um, causal determinism is a synchronic problem that has to do with causality. So, um, what is involved in talking about God's foreknowledge is that, well, at least our speaking, uh, speaking the truth about God's infallible foreknowledge, that applies, that, that implies or seems to imply the actual fixity of the future. I'll come back to that in the third part. But that, you know, just take that for granted now, that you know, talking about God's foreknowledge implies, or at least seems to imply, that the future is fixed, the future is determined. Um, it's not open. Um, on the other hand, causal determinism uh, um, implies that God's will, um, understood here again, I suppose, implies that the created effect must occur because God's causation is irresistible. Nothing can go against God. Nothing can resist God's um, efficacious um, activity, if 
God causes it, then uh, it just happens. It cannot not happen. So the problem of temporal fatalism is, as I mentioned before, is that um, if God foreknows the whole future, then it seems seems to imply that the whole future is is, uh, is, as, is as fixed, as determinate, um, as past and present, and that there is no open future. Uh, also, problem is that um, all created uh, effects at the very moment that they are created are uh, necessary. So to just have a picture of temporal fatalism. So God here uh, talking to maybe, I don't know, might be Moses or something. But God says, um, no, I understand you don't want to watch next week's episode of American Idol. But I've already seen that you will, that you will, that that you will. So there is nothing we can do. So if the future is fixed, determined, then uh, no, there is nothing uh, human beings or even God can do to change that future. Also, determinism. If you want to picture it, it looks more like a puppet on a string, so the hand above, that's the divine hand, and you know, all of creatures are just puppets on a string, and they do automatically whatever God causes them to do. Um, now, what, now what, what I want to do is to, 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 um, uh, to elaborate a li little bit more on this temporal fatalism, what is behind it. And um, I want to start with what probably maybe most of you will know, uh, Boethius, a classical solution to the problem of uh, divine foreknowledge um, and uh, human freedom. So Boethius has this problem of uh, what, is called, what, he, what is called the, uh, the eternal gate. So imagine, um, reality, created reality, as a backward procession uh, in a play. Uh, so, for example, if this is you know, now, if this is me, you know, and I'm walking but backward, you know, so the direction of time go is, uh, is this way, so I'm proceeding with my back to the future. All I can see, all I can know is those who went before me. So the past, I can know, uh, I can only know the past. I cannot know or see the future, those who come, be, uh, who come after me and behind me. But if there is, a, you know, imagine God here, well, all seeing eyes, in a watchtower, you know, who is outside of time, who oversees the whole plane, the whole procession, the whole movement of history, that divine observer uh, can see the whole of history, including uh, the future, so including uh, what I, I who am in time, cannot know. But there is a problem with this picture. Because it, a Boethius solution um, presupposes a particular view on time, what um, is usually labeled um, a tense uh, view or a, a dynamic view on time. So in modern, at least since the 1920s with McTaggart, um, in modern philosophy of time, there are basically two uh, views uh, on time. There is the, uh, well, it has different labels. Uh, you can call it the dynamic view of time or the tensed view on time or the presentist view. There are different versions of it, but what interests me, what is most interest is the, is a dynamic view on time or a tense view on time with an open future. Um, so in this view, you, take the non-relational and changing categories, or properties of past, present, and future as basic. 
these pres past, present, and future, uh, they, they always change. But in this view of time, you think that these are the basic categories to think of time. And with, if you have a dynamic view on time with an open future, um, you can picture it as uh, the arrowhead of the now that draws the line of the past behind it. So it looks, um, oh, it looks like this. I must confess, it took me some time to get this arrow moving in my, uh, in my presentation. But so the idea is um, that um, you see, you know, here you see uh, that the future is open. There's just empty space. There is no fixed future. There's an open future. And the now proceeds, draws the line of the past uh, behind it and um, okay, then fills in the future, so to say. This is contrasted with what is usually labeled a, a static or an endless or eternalist view on time. Here you, uh, the picture of time is not so much a moving arrow, but the picture is like uh, a static um, timeline or a block universe, you know, the big red line on uh, here on at the bottom. Um, in this view on time, you do not take the changing categories of past, and present, and future as basic, but you take the unchangeable the relational categories of earlier than, simultaneous with, and later than as basic. So you think of the whole of reality as four dimensional, four dimensional uh, matrix. And so for our consciousness, this, you know, uh, what is it, November, November 19, 2021, has a kind of metaphysical or ontological priority, but that is only a human illusion. In itself, in reality, metaphysically, November 19, 2021, is at the same level as the coronation of Charlemagne in uh, 800, or uh, the, uh, the assassination uh, of Caesar, or in 44 BC. So um, in this static view on time, um, there is no priority of uh, the present, uh, of what we experience now as present. And the future, you can see the future is as determinate and as fixed as what is now for us at this moment, past and present. So there is no modal difference between what for us at a certain, what for us now is past, present, and future. In reality, uh, they all, all these events, and whether they occur in 44 BC or in uh, 3600 CE, all these events have the same ontological uh, status. So if we now go back to uh, Boethius, um, so the problem with uh, Boethius is that, uh, in fact, his solution Im uh, implies a block universe. It, it implies this aesthetic uh, view on, um, on time. It implies that what is for us now, for me here or for, and for you, what for us is now, um, and what for us is future, that future exists in the very same way as what is asked for us. In reality, um, there is no modal difference between past, present, and future. They are all as contingent or as necessary. Uh, uh, you know, the past or the future is as contingent and or as necessary as the past or the present. Are so what um, Boethius says is that, that okay um, he 
reduces the problem of divine foreknowledge to just a problem of knowledge. So we cannot know the future, but metaphysically or ontologically, the future, what is future for us now at this moment, is as fixed as and as determinate um, as what is past. Though we cannot know it, it's there, so, um, so to say. Well, now, of course, you can say, right, well, problem is solved. You know, take just uh, what's wrong with the static uh, view on time? What's wrong with this block universe? Well, I, in itself, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, but here I would, well, I would argue uh, first, I do not like an appeal to folk intuitions too much, but in this case, I think the folk intuition, so just the intuition of normal people, you're not, not philosophers or theologians, but normal people, they somehow, and well, most of us are pretty normal, I hope, but we somehow feel that, okay, there is a difference between the past and the future. The future is somehow, we feel, up to us, or indeterminate, or open. We somehow feel that there is a difference in the modal status between, on the one hand, one hand past and present, and on the other hand, um, uh, the future. So if we, I think that philosophy and theology uh, should comply with these kind of folk intuitions as much as possible. The second reason why I would prefer this dynamic view with an open future is that I think it is intellectually more demanding. Um, you know, how to uh, reconcile this view on time, the dynamic view on time with an open future, how to reconcile that uh, with uh, divine uh, for with divine uh, for knowledge. If you assume a static view on time, with uh, you know no uh, no open future, then it's pretty easy to explain. Just like we see, it, it's pretty easy to explain how God foreknows the future. And then, but that says maybe something about my character. Then I always get a little bit suspicious. You know, if solutions are too easy. Um, oh yeah, all right, and then the next slide. Just again, to this is not something new, but the same way of trying to explain the difference between um, these, the dynamic and aesthetic view uh, on time, but now more on the, on the level of logic of propositions. Uh, which is usually what we understand when you, when you, when you use the word tensed view on time, um, then usually focuses on these logical, not so much on metaphysical, but on the logical, um, logical perspective or dimension of the problem. So if you have a dynamic view on time with an open future, then you uh, suppose that in logic, tenses and temporal indexicals are, irre are irreducible. Um, so, and as a consequence, um, if there is an open future, then propositions about future contingencies lack truth value. So if, um, there, if we have a proposition like, there will be a sea battle tomorrow, I guess that most of you, or some of you will recognize this, this as that's the example that, that Aristotle gives in the De Interpretazione chapter nine. There will be sea battle tomorrow. Is that true or is it not true? Um, suppose, no, no, so I, 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 uh, I make this, I, I utter this uh, proposition right now on November 19. So then tomorrow refers to November 20. In the tense view on time, you say you, you you take this tense, the future tense will be, and you take the what is called the temporal indexical, you take them as irreducible. So a temporal indexical means it's a you know 
an indication of a moment of time, the reference of which depends on the moment it is uttered. Probably all know, uh, you know, sometimes when you go to uh, a shop and there is a note that says, uh, I'll be back within 10 minutes. Yeah, but, you know, uh, that is in, uh, in, in indexical because you do not know when the person wrote that note. So you still have no idea when that person will be back. So in, in, in uh, temporal indexical is you know, a term that indicates time, mo moment in time, but the reference of which depends on the moment that the term is uttered. If you can contrast this with a static view, that's what, um, then you say that tenses and temporal uh, indexicals, they are just grammatical uh, things, but in logic, you say these tenses and indexicals can be removed, they can be reduced. That's what most, at least many, uh, logicians will argue. So then um, you can say, you then you say in a static view, you say, well, this sentence, utterance, there will be a sea battle tomorrow, can be reduced, can be logically, should be logically translated into the sentence or the proposition. There is, and is should be understood not as present tense, but as tenseness. There is a sea battle on November 20, 2021. And um, then you can say, well, this, uh, this proposition uh, is true or it is false. As I explained when talking about Boethius, we might not know whether the proposition is true or false, but we can state the, that the proposition is true or false, but either one. It's, there's no third um, possibility. It's either true or not true or false. Then in that case, you will have, you will not really have a problem with defined foreknowledge because you say, well, we might not know whether that proposition is true, but God can know uh, whether the proposition is true or false. However, if you take you know, the previous one, the dynamic view with open future, then you say, well, uh, a proposition like there will be a sea battle tomorrow, that is a proposition that it lacks a truth value. It's neither true nor false. So this is kind of three valued logic you know, it's instead of two valued logic of either true or false. There is now a third possibility, which we call a truth gap or lacking a truth value. If you say, well, this proposition is uh, neither true uh, nor false. I would, but that's a different argument. I would say that this is also what Aristotle is up to in De Interpretatione, uh, chapter nine. Um, and I think it also that he's very much right uh, about. Uh, this we will not go into an Aristotle um, exegesis. Uh, 